ladies and gentlemen, we are very happy to welcome <coughs> Professor Tima Bench as our guest today. Uh, Professor Tima Bench, please uh, tell us more about your research, about its goal and the mission. Okay, so since I was a child, I was interested in how my body functions and with major focus on the brain. So how our brain uh, makes it possible that we are who we are. Um, and this brought me then during my studies to study neurobiology. And then I, I, I stepped into the field of developmental neurobiology because understanding how such a great organ like the human brain develops might provide some insights into uh, how the brain works. So coming from the field of developmental neurobiology, I also uh, um, thought that it's, or we, we thought the human uh, genetic code was decoded that time when I started my PhD. And uh, it was disappointing how few genes we have, protein encoding genes, speaking of protein encoding genes. And it was very clear that this genetic code cannot encode for the enormous diversity of neurons that are formed and uh, also for the information where they go from the domains where they are born and what do they and what connections do they do. So we looked for environmental cues that time and uh, currently I'm connecting these two aspects. So I am asking how such environmental information that for example a neuron sees during his development migration, how is this integrated into the genome orchestrating um, transcriptional networks that in turn mediate their proper development and cell fate specification. This brought me into the field of epigenetics. And so now I'm doing neuroepigenetics with a focus on developmental neuroepigenetics. But as these processes like proliferation, migration, not only relevant during proper brain development, but also in cancer related questions, we are now also stepping into the field of brain cancer research, yeah, applying these molecular mechanisms. And what we are currently investigating in terms of epigenetic mechanisms is the question of how target specific DNA methylation can occur in response to external stimuli that a cell perceives. We know DNA methylation is not static, it's plastic. It can be removed, it can be newly set, and we know it's responsive to outer stimuli, so to speak. And my question is, how does a DNA methyltransferase knows where to methylate in our genome? And here we are focusing on the group of long non-coding RNAs. It's a large group of non-coding RNAs. They might encode for peptides, but not for proteins. And they are structural proteins, which can mediate such recruitment and targeting of proteins, epigenetic writers to certain genomic loads and in response to certain environmental stimulation. Thank you so much for this. Um, could you tell us more about the lab culture you have? How do you decide which new projects to grant? Um, how does it differ between the students versus more senior scientists in your lab? Mm, okay, so of course I'm driven by my interest. <laughs> I'm sorry. But of course, uh, I was always influenced by the surrounding where I am now. When I was in uh, the former university, there was an aging focus. So I we also included some aging aspects. And here, um, there, there are other foci, for example, glioplastoma, which also uh, drove me here a little bit. So projects are developing, actually usually and 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 sometimes also a circle is closing this is what i like very much yeah that i come back to former research and that they com can combine former research with the new ideas arising so actually sometimes i see myself like a flipper you know a ball and a flipper so i i have a certain intrinsic direction but this is always modulated by ideas from outside by the local situation that we have, and this this was this was always fascinating, uh, in which ways this went. <coughs> the lab culture, of course, also ideas from my students are uh, integrated. Um, however, I have 
most students of my team are PhD students. I also have um, a postdoc, and that a postdoc is currently being recruited. Who postdocs bring more in their own ideas, but for PhD students, it's it's good if they have projects. Yeah. If, if they have a main project, which however can be modulated according to what happens, according what they find out. So ideas are integrated, but usually PhDs, they, they, have, they, have, they have a project, an idea that I was developing and master students or undergraduate students, they are also integrated in these larger projects, having an own small aspect in this project, but contributing to a larger, yeah, to, to a larger question. So the, this is the structure. So we are quite mixed. We have, I think, five, now six PhD students. We have a postdoc, we have technical assistants, and we have master and bachelor students. Yes, uh, thank you so much for this information. Um, our viewers may consist of several uh, audiences, and this can be students, this can be senior researchers. They can be also patients who are looking for some information. Uh, to address their specific diseases, but this can be also the investors, business angels, and VCs. Um, what message would you have uh, to each of these three groups, those who want to join your lab, those who are patients, and those who are investors? Ooh. So far, my work is, is, is still mainly settled in basic research. Yeah, so of course I have the dream to find a cure for glioblastoma, the most deadly brain cancer in the world. But uh, of course, I guess during my lifetime, I will not find this because it, it's, it's just so, so complex. But I have the dream to contribute with some essential new mechanistics to the development of optional therapy strategies. So one thing is what we are currently investigating we know that DNA methylation, we know that long non coding RNAs are involved in integrating also environmental information in uh, the progression of the cancer. So we are trying to find out, for example, in the current project, which exact site of interface between a DNA methyl transferase and a long non coding RNA takes place, where we might interfere with small molecules. Yeah, this interaction, whereas other interactions are not affected to have a higher degree of specificity and a higher or less side effects that usually come with this very rough chemotherapeutic approaches. So I don't know whether I have a message for investors. <laughs> I think we are not yet there and I, I even if it is much more harder uh, to do basic research, to recruit funding for basic research, I still see myself mainly there. But if investors have ideas, I'm happy to discuss with them. Good. And to those who would like to join your research laboratory, uh, what they should know? Can you repeat the question? I'm sorry. Those who would like to join your research laboratory, is there anything special that they should know or be aware about? Um, they should be highly integrative and team players because this is how we do our projects. Yeah, so it's not that people say it's my project. We we have certain methodological fo foci. So there is more primary neuron culture. Yeah, there is more hardcore molecular biology, and we together make up a project. This is what uh, someone should should know. Um, so what I expect from people is, of course, motivation and high intrinsic motivation. Um, and also um, to be a team player. This is important for us. <clears throat> sure. Uh, looking to the perspective and the outlook of your uh, research, uh, what would you uh, mention here? The outlook of my research. <clears throat> um, a larger outlook of my research. This is always hard for me because um, it is developing in paths, but of course I would like to contribute to decode the complex epigenetic network that is far more complex than we have thought initially, uh, how this is orchestrating brain developmental processes, cancer-related processes, and how this can be modulated. What are the mechanisms um, um, that modulate the integration of external stimuli? 
So I, I stick to my research question, actually. And of course, one important outcome when we talk about the glioma research line would be to find novel strategies for treatment options. Yeah. So, so if I could dream, I would say I, uh, I would like to contribute to find uh, treatment options that enable survival. I mean, these patients, they uh, usually roughly survive a year after diagnosis with, with uh, kind of full treatment. Yeah. So um, this is something that, uh, that I would, that I would wish, but I don't know how realistic this is. Sure. Um, is there anything that you would like to add besides that, what we already spoken about? No, no, not yet, except that I'm a professor for neuroepigenetics and I'm also implementing uh, these aspects into my teaching here at the RWTH Aachen University and into my seminars. Maybe a little bit advertisement for 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 Aachen in Germany. <laughs> sure, um, uh, Professor Zimmer, thank you so much. Uh, it was a pleasure to have you today with us. <laughs>